Hello, friends, and thanks for checking out another episode of the podcast. On today's episode, I welcome back Stephen Bernstein, director, writer, and cinematographer. Today, we chat about psychology and how it goes hand in hand with directing and filmmaking. Enjoy. Hey, Stephen, welcome back to the podcast. Hi, Matt. Good to be here. So I know um, I've always kind of known psychology and directing kind of go hand in hand, but not fully, you know, because I've just not enough experience. But yeah, I wanted to have you back on just to really kind of dive into the subject and um, kind of, yeah, if you could share a lot of your experience. Sure. Look, I think that um, one of the biggest parts of directing is the psychological. Um, it really uh, comes down to understanding the role of the director. And to my mind, the director's principal occupation is the facilitation of others. A lot of directors, young directors, particularly those who come out of film school, take some comfort in the control and mastery of the technology because technology is predictable. You set up a camera in a particular way with a particular aperture, and you can get a predictable result. Less so with human beings, but it's through those human beings that we can create the most compelling films. And it really is up to us to figure out a way to get them to do their best work and to make their most profound creative contribution. Take, for example, uh, actors. You know, years ago, I worked on a film called uh, SWAT, um, huge crew, lots of equipment, three-quarter size airplanes, um, explosions, rockets, uh, stunt people, uh, big set. Imagine what it was like for an actor to arrive if it was their first film on that set on that particular day. They would be uh, frightened uh, and intimidated, and it would be those things that would prevent them from giving their best performance. So my job as a director, be it on a film like that or on a smaller film, is first to create an environment that is nurturing. It's like good parenting. An actor, and for that matter, any crew member has to know that when they do something well, uh, they will be uh, rewarded. But they should also know that when they fail, uh, they won't be punished. That ultimately there is a safety net, that they are protected, that they will be facilitated, and that we are very much um, in it together. That's good directing, that's good leadership, and that's good psychology. Mm -hmm. People do their best work when they don't feel threatened. People do their worst work when they're terrified of failure. So you have to eliminate the idea of potential failure uh, from the equation. There are choices, um, there are options, there are decisions, but ultimately nothing will fail. You're interested in anything that the actor might deliver. They should also know that um, even though you as a director may feel the pressures of money and time, you can never transmit that uh, to your actors. Uh, the producer could be screaming in your ear that you're behind, but you have to demonstrate to the actor that you're calm, that your focus is entirely on them, and you care about them achieving what they hope uh, to achieve. I have a ritual that after every take, um, I walk to the set, I make eye contact with each actor. I generally uh, touch them to let them know that I'm there so that they're aware that I'm cognizant of what they've been trying. I will give a note to each of them. I'll praise them when they do well. And one thing I will never do is lie to them. Mm -hmm. The worst thing, again, psychologically you can do as a director is run up to an actor and say, oh, you were fantastic. Now let's do another take. Well, why do another? They yeah. lose trust. Yeah, of course. Trust. Why, why do another take if things were perfect? And if they know that you're selling to them, and I've got a thesis that all human interaction is dishonest because we're always selling, kind mm -hmm. of. We're selling ourselves. We're selling an idea. We're selling a notion. We're selling a philosophy. 
And when you run up to an actor and say, great job, I understand you're trying to give them positive reinforcement, theoretically falling within this idea that um, you're creating a nurturing environment, but you're also being dishonest. Mm -hmm. And that means that when the actor does do something well and you tell them they're great, they're going to say, yeah, well, you're the same guy who told me five minutes ago that I was great when I did something that wasn't good. Mm -hmm. So again, like a good parent, a good friend, like a good lover, like a good companion, you have to tell the absolute truth to actors all the time. And then they know that they can trust you because that idea of trust, as well as the sense of being nurtured and protected, are two of the most important things you can do psychologically uh, for your actors on the film set. Mm -hmm. And that's why you should always be kind of specific, right? You, you could always say, you know, I loved this you know, part of your performance, but this part, you know, could use some work or, you know, however you give notes. Right. Well, you, you might say, yeah, this is good. And then you might say, I'm not sure about this part is usually what I say. Mm -hmm. I try to pose things as questions. But the other thing I also try to do is show my own imperfection and vulnerability. Again, like good parenting. Um, you want an actor. In fact, you want the whole crew to know that you're not holding yourself up as something that's perfect, that you too have fears um, and inadequacies. And I try to put that uh, front and center from the minute I arrive on set. One of the first things I do when I start a film is I announce to the crew that um, I have ambitions and intentions for the movie. I hope to achieve them. I have questions about my own skill set in certain areas that I need their help, that they should feel free to come forward with their own ideas in appropriate moments, um, and that uh, I am frightened if I am frightened, and that uh, we are in it together. These things are essential. When an actor hears a director say to them, that didn't work, but I don't know why, mm -hmm. it goes again to your essential honesty. They know that you are telling them the truth because you're admitting something that uh, would suggest some weakness in you. And we tend to trust people when they admit weakness. Uh, we don't necessarily feel comfortable around people who are perfect because we don't feel we are ourselves perfect and inevitably will feel inadequate when someone around us who project, projects themselves as perfect or we see them as dishonest, one or the other. You can't win either way. So you have to be human to lead. Absolutely. And one of the things that you mentioned that stood out to me was that you've, you know, you've handled huge sets, you know, major stresses behind that, you know, and, and my point, you know, the biggest budget I've handled personally is like $5,000, $6,000. Right. And so for you, you know, it, I'm sure it's the same stress, but managed differently, you know, and then. Oh yeah. No, look, I'm, I'm terrified. I, I, admit all the time, and people are shocked to hear that that before the first day of a shoot, I am certain that I have forgotten everything that I knew before. I'm certain that I'm going to uh, fail. I'm certain that I'm going to make a fool of myself. And I'm certain that I'm going to get fired. Uh, never get fired. Um, I, I achieve, I succeed. Um, I've worked on films, I've won Oscars and so on. Uh, you would think that would build confidence. It does to a certain degree, mm. but all that happens is you then move up the ladder and then you're on a new film that has new stresses and, and new fears. Uh, the way I inoculate myself against that is going to what I was talking about a moment ago, which is I tell everyone around me that I'm worried. Uh, I tell them about my inadequacies. It's the, again, it's counterintuitive. It's because everything that you would naturally think to do, but it's the best thing you can do because what you discover is that everybody else is frightened as well. Everyone else is concerned about failing uh, also. And when they know that you're the person who's being open and honest, uh, that you are capable uh, by your honesty and your humanness of empathy, they're drawn to you mm -hmm. and then they'll help you. And when you say to a crew, I'm not always sure what I'm doing, but I need your help. That's when a crew will step up when you scream at people, the worst thing you can do. Yeah. When you say that you're the smartest person in the room, when you constantly try to demonstrate how smart and powerful and right you are, you alienate the crew. And then rather than having 700 people working on your behalf, you have 700 people hoping you'll fail. Mm -hmm. And that's a good way to fail. Wow, that's very true. And um, so psychology, you know, just not even from how the standpoint of, of interacting with people on set, it, it stems to... Um, you know, as a writer director, when we develop these characters as well. 
It's all look. That's I think the most important uh, part of this this uh, really equation again is um, how we create characters. There's so much that happens in Hollywood now uh, based on orthodoxies and goes to this the nature of, of fear because producers, investors, filmmakers, studios are worried about failure, they tend to take the most conservative course. They want to find a, a standardized way of making films. They want to find an orthodoxy. And that extends uh, to the screenplay. There's all these script gurus and there are books, which you know and your listeners will know, uh, that are always about uh, the three acts and about very specific uh, structures. And it is prescriptive. Uh, you have to write a uh, script in a particular way. You have to reach plot points by a particular page. I mean, some go right down, say page 10 or page 11, something specific has to happen. Mm -hmm. So when you write using that methodology, you begin having your characters speak to serve narrative. And in life, uh, we don't speak to serve narrative because we don't know what our life narrative is going to be. We wake up in chaos, we live in chaos, we go to bed uh, in chaos. The old joke, how do you make God laugh? You know, you make plans. <laughs> and it is that inconsistency of the human experience that we recognize in each other. But often we don't see it in films. And the audience naturally senses when a character isn't speaking as they speak or as people they know speak. They know when your character is serving narrative you, they know when your character is providing exposition to give them information about where the narrative is inevitably going to turn mm. to the point where most of us within five minutes, we don't have to be filmmakers, can kind of predict where a movie's going to go. But we can't predict where our lives are going to go. And ultimately, our lives, therefore, are sometimes more compelling than the movies that we watch. So when you look at other writers or filmmakers, so people like Mike Lee, for example, John Cassavetes, they don't always make the most commercial of films, but they do create some of the most interesting characters because the characters have many agendas. They are addressing uh, voices uh, long dead. They're speaking to their parents. They're talking about their own inadequacies. They're thinking about their work, but they're thinking about their lovers. They're thinking about all the things that constantly engage us in ordinary life. And that's the way we navigate the human experience. And that's the way really our character should navigate the human experience to be wholly believable. It is the verisimilitude of a character that how they replicate our actual experience of the non-cinematic world, that we identify them as real. Um, if there isn't that verisimilitude, if that character doesn't seem to have our own inconsistencies, we can enjoy a film, but it's as if we're observing it rather than fully engaging it. Mm, now, I, I have a writing method that some people employ, which uh, my first draft is what I call slop draft. I just write very, very quickly. Uh, I don't have any outline that I work to and no structure. And mainly what this first draft features is very long dialogue sequences. Mm -hmm. Why? because I am discovering who my characters are as I write. I don't think we know who our characters are before we write. So creating an outline about their story means inevitably the focus is gonna be on narrative and not on character. Mm -hmm. And I think that's always less interesting. It is, and one of the biggest points that I took away from your radical approaches to screenwriting is when we're creating these you know, backstories on characters, we're you know, I've, I've cheated, you know, I've made the backstory very specific to fit the narrative of right. the film, you know? And um, yeah, so that's one of the things that I took away from it. It's just to not do that. <laughs> that well, everybody does that um, because story is easy. You know, we have a natural momentum towards least resistance. And when we sit down creatively to write something, one of the things we'll do is have two hand scenes where one character speaks to another uh, because it's easier. Mm -hmm. A person speaks, a person responds, a person speaks. And now if we add to that the idea that we have uh, an outline that we're working to, we know that they have to say, meet me in the boathouse later or whatever the narrative element is you're trying to get across. Or so often in films, they're trying to explain how superhuman the male lead is. You know, he's ex-CIA, uh, He's a maverick. He was fired, 
but of course he also has a graduate degree from Harvard. Uh, what's really happening there? Are we recognize our own experience in that, or are they just trying to tell us this person is very, very special? Mm -hmm. It's contrived uh, exposition and will inevitably, I think, distance uh, an audience. Mm -hmm. um, instead, if we can find that uh, special um, empathy um, in character, if instead uh, we find that they're not just speaking to one character, but to several characters. And if instead of them serving narrative, they're serving many different agendas, personal and otherwise, then we recognize um, a real uh, character and the audience becomes genuinely engaged with them and our film has a greater likelihood uh, you know, of success, which is why going to the idea of writing backstory based on narrative, it, it's easier that way uh, because the narrative is simple. We're just telling a story. But when we're trying to understand another human being, and that human being, like all human beings, is inconsistent, then it's much, much harder work. Mm -hmm. And you said the key word uh, recently, empathy. You know, empathy is very important for, you know, the director's perspective for not just the characters, but, you know, um, guiding those actors sure. into that performance. Well, what is empathy? That's that's what we have to define. I mean, what what makes us care about another about another person. And there's various devices that are obvious. First of all, if they do things that we do, we recognize ourselves in them because they're like us. Uh, there's a great device that's very simple that every screenwriter should use. If you have a character on screen by themselves, then we know that we're in on a secret. If we see a character, for example, about to go on a date, and maybe it's a male character, they've started to, they're losing their hair. And we see them in front of a mirror and now they're combing their hair in various ways to cover their bald patch. At that moment, the character hasn't spoken. Um, they haven't done anything spectacular. They're not blowing up anything. They don't have a gun out. They're not chasing anyone. There's no narrative. But what we're witnessing is a character's vulnerability. We're sharing a secret with them. We know something about their interior monologue. Then when they go on a date, and this is an obvious and, and, and terrible trope, but I'm giving this example. And the girl <laughs> says, I love bald men. Uh, they show such confidence. Um, we know something about the other character, the male character's interior life that she doesn't. And right away, we feel connected with that character because we're sharing their perspective on her remark. It's devices like that that build a bridge between audience and character and establish empathy. And I'm talking about vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Just like I said at the beginning of this, when a director reveals that they themselves are vulnerable and subject to all the same forces and securities as ordinary human beings, when a character does that, an audience will uh, inevitably relate to them. Same thing with universal experience. Mm -hmm. uh, we all live most of our lives in fear. So when a character is at menace, when a character is in danger, inevitably, whoever that character is, the audience will feel empathic because we feel in danger most of the time. Hitchcock was a genius at employing this mechanism. Uh, in Frenzy, there's a serial killer who's in the back of, I think, a potato truck. And he's with a body of someone he's killed. And the reason he's on that potato truck is when he's killing this woman, she's pulled a ring or stick pin uh, off him. And it's in her rigor mortis held hand. And a police car is pulled up behind the potato truck. Now, I may be misremembering it. And if he didn't do it this way, he should have. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he's then trying to open the hand to get the ring out so that he can put it on his hand and get off the potato truck. Meanwhile, the police car is right behind him. Now, you would think there's no way in the world the audience would have any empathy for a serial killer. Mm -hmm. And yet, they always do. They do, yeah. Why? Because we're not intellectually engaged in uh, identifying who this person is morally. We're instead empathically engaged with a universal experience of fear. And vulnerability. Of, and vulnerability. Exactly yeah, that's right. fascinating. <laughs> yeah, that is yeah. so cool. Yeah. So, and we do this all the time. And, and I think one of the functions of the first act, and again, here I am using terms like first act, second act, third act, but is um, two things. First of all, 
you want the audience to engage with your character. So show them uh, as vulnerable. And one of the great ways to show them vulnerable is to create an understanding of them. So have them on screen by themselves. I said, uh, I think earlier, that I believe that all human interaction is dishonest. Mm -hmm. Whenever we're speaking to someone, we're selling ourselves, we're selling an idea, we're trying to convince them of something. So uh, we know, even with our lovers, our partners, or people in business, or we associate with, that there's some level of dishonesty. So inevitably, there's some level of distrust. But when a character is on screen by themselves and not speaking to anyone, uh, they're not manipulating anybody or anything. They're authentic. Yeah. They're authentic and they're showing the genuine themselves. And because they're on screen by themselves and we see them on screen by themselves, we feel, we know them, therefore we empathize with them, therefore everything that happens to them subsequently we care about and that makes our film uh, that much better. The second part of, uh, of that proposition about how to begin a film I think is mystery. I believe that all films are mysteries, all films, comedies, drama, action, all are mysteries. Now, sometimes it's a mystery of narrative, what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's a mystery of character. Why are they behaving in that way? If you see someone behaving eccentrically at the beginning of a film, particularly if they've been on camera by themselves, then you're saying, okay, I care about this character, but they're behaving oddly. I wonder why. Yeah, it immediately and raises questions. Exactly. And the minute you're raising questions and you've got the audience engaged, they're going to keep watching to find out why the person's behaved that way. I mentioned Mike Lee earlier. Look at the beginning of a marvelous film called Happy Go Lucky uh, with uh, Sally Hawkins. And we see Sally Hawkins riding her bicycle at the beginning of the film, uh, just joyous and happy, very atypical of a Mike Lee film where usually people are sad and depressed. And she walks into a bookstore and behaves in the odd. Now, right away, she's been on screen by herself, and she's behaved eccentrically. Uh, and she has a certain amount of charm and humanity as well, because we see her as vulnerable and insecure. She's a guy in the bookstore who does, isn't answering her. And she's, she's f obviously feeling very, very uncomfortable. So we have vulnerability, we have screen time by herself, and we have eccentricity. Right away, we're engaged. We want to know who she is. We're going to keep watching, and we care about her. Mm. That's a good opening. Uh, for a movie. Uh, you know, a lot of people like to do cold opens where a big chase scene or explosion. That can work too if a character's at risk because again, we're seeing them as vulnerable and we share that vulnerability because we're living in fear all the time. But it's even more interesting, I think, to see the humanity of a character, their vulnerabilities and what makes them imperfect. That to me is the most compelling thing about the human condition, our imperfections. Mm -hmm. And the more that I think about it, you know, psychology spans much further than just directing itself. It sounds like films are <laughs> psychology. That's all films are, really, or should be. Um, sure, uh, you can have an action film. And you think, well, action films got nothing to do with psychology. But why do we enjoy um, action films? First of all, we have to recognize a principle uh, that originated with theater, which is the temporal suspension of disbelief. When you go into a movie theater, you know you're seeing a movie. At no time uh, are you, do you believe that you're actually living in the object reality when you're looking at a two-dimensional projection. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, there are a few crazy people maybe that, that uh, get a little bit more involved in films than the rest of us. But for the most people, they see that it is, it's, it's the fictive world they're observing, and they enjoy it because of this temporal suspension of disbelief. They will accept that this is the betrayal of the real world, even though uh, they know it isn't. So right away, there's a big psychological principle at work because your audience is engaged in a self-delusion. Mm. And so all this concept around delusion is central to understanding of psychology. All of us are delusional to a greater or lesser degree. We choose to believe in the things that we believe in. There's something called a confirmation bias. When we have a particular view of the world, uh, right now everything is very political in America, so when we have a particular political view of the world, we see everything through that prism. Um, whatever the other side is, we will see them as villainous and our side is better, not because it's right, although it may be, but rather because we have a perspective and we force that perspective on all things um, that we look at. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so it is uh, with with film. Um, we've decided to temporarily suspend our disbelief. We've decided to see that what we're looking at um, is uh, objective reality. And then what happens next is when it's a horror film, for example, and someone's being stabbed horribly and we scream, do we believe that someone's actually being stabbed? We don't because we know it's a movie. And yet we're responding as if we're seeing something genuinely horrible because we have decided to psychologically engage in this vicarious adventure. We have decided to psychologically engage in this vicarious adventure. And that then extends to romance, to people falling in love. It extends to who we see as heroic, because then we identify very often with a heroic person. We know we're not them, but we're living vicariously through their experience of their vicarious world. And we take some enjoyment from it. And I think it's hugely important psychologically because we can live all these experiences. We can put ourselves uh, at risk. We can overcome obstacles, but because it's not the real world, we're not in genuine danger. So we can live out our primal fantasies and survive them, whereas we can't always do that in the real world. So all of film is based in this uh, psychological landscape of uh, fantasy and need and desire and fear. And when we serve those functions in our audience, then we're good um, filmmakers. When we're not psychologically engaging our audience, when uh, they don't see our world as even possibly real, when our fictive universe is so disconnected from the ordinary experience of life, uh, then we've failed as filmmakers. And that's all to do with an understanding of the psychological engagement of audience in film. Mm -hmm. And even when we get down to studying like human behavior for directors, um, I know that's really important. I mean, we, in the real world, if a bunch of group of people look at a certain, or, you know, turn their heads and look in a certain direction, it, it you know, it, it engages us to look in that direction as well. And that's the same principles in film. You know, when you have someone look a certain direction, the audience wants to see obviously what they're looking at. And oh, so ab absolutely. Or what they're feeling. And look, imagine, let's take, we talk about various examples of openings. If you open a film and you see someone crying, um, right away, you're not thinking, okay, this is an actress or an actor crying on screen and I don't care about them. I think right away with saying, why are they crying? What are they crying about? And then very often, I don't know if you do, but I do, I cry in films. Mm -hmm. Now, sure. why, why would I possibly be crying in films? Because it's not real. This is a fictive world. And yet I'm crying. Why? because it must relate to some psychological trigger within me that reminds me of some sadness, uh, some sadness from some experience. And that's what film does. That's ultimately what we should always be trying to do in film is to understand the triggers in our audience. And then I think we have moral obligation, not just to trigger the audience, but then to provide something of benefit. Otherwise we're simply being manipulative. Mm -hmm. So an action film, we can terrify an audience with an explosion. A horror film, someone could be stabbed and they could scream. But in a better film, we might look at our shared condition and say, you know, why are we sad about these things? Uh, what causes uh, pain? How can we recover from pain? You know, what is the nature of love? Um, is intimacy possible? All those other, you know, big uh, principles and we can do that by first connecting our audience with something they can psychologically identify with. And going to your remark about, look, imagine if that woman was crying or that man was crying and um, they look up and their eyes open wide and they look stunned by something and we cut. Now, isn't the audience at that point going to want to know what that person was looking at that so surprised them? So, and that becomes emblematic of the whole process of filmmaking. When we see behavior from a character, we want to know the reason for that behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, it's inevitable and goes to our own individual psychological makeup. We see the world as a grand labyrinth or puzzle, and we want to figure it out. We see people as a puzzle. We want to figure them out. 
We see characters as a puzzle, and that's the mystery of film that engages audience. And that's why film is one of the best art forms, probably the best. <laughs> Well, I, I think yeah, <laughs> if I want to do a, a, a comparative analysis of, of, of art, form, for me, certainly, <laughs> it's, it, it's the best art form because uh, that temporal suspension of disbelief becomes a, a much grayer thing uh, than when we're looking at a painting. I think when we look at a painting, for example, in fine art, there may be a narrative of sorts there. But really what we're observing is composition and uh, color and uh, a brush stroke. And there is some emotional or intellectual response, but it's not like, quite rightly, as you observe, like film, where we are transported and suddenly believe at some level, because it's never a complete or absolute, that we are living that life. I mean, it really sweeps us up, and now we think that we are in the film. Uh, same thing uh, with theater. Theater's harder because... There may be three boxes on stage, and we're to believe that's the you know the cityscape of New York, whereas in film they'll actually show us uh, New York, and it's seductive and it is effective. Um, visual effects have gotten so good now that we find ourselves believing images that can't possibly be real, but all our senses tell us that they are. So again, that gray line between the real and the not real is blurred, and our temporary suspension of disbelief becomes much easier. And we become even more engaged in those things that are being presented to us. Mm -hmm. So in terms of, uh, I mean, I have no, no other questions. <laughs> so, I mean, in terms of, do you think of anything else that, you know, could apply psychology and filmmaking and well, any other kind of? Well, I, look, psychology it, it goes to all parts. First of all, it's the, it's the filmmaking process itself. That a director has to be a master um, psychologist. Uh, film directing is about leadership. And to lead people, you have to show vulnerability. You have to appreciate people's good work. They have to feel uh, they're working in a safe uh, and nurturing uh, environment. Uh, you can't show fear in yourself. You can show vulnerability. But you also have to recognize that if you're panicked, everybody else uh, will panic. Uh, it's also a great way of discovering your better self. Because film is a high-risk occupation and very, very stressful. And you learn over the... I've worked on something like 100 projects now, television shows, uh, feature films. Uh, uh, I go into commercials and music videos even more. But I've had so many experiences where I've uh, been living in terror or that uh, I've been tested uh, emotionally, uh, intellectually, and every other way a person can uh, be tested. So you discover something about yourself psychologically. You discover how you can become uh, the best person uh, that you can be, but also how you can best facilitate the people around you. So it's not just directors, but anybody who's successful in the film industry has to become a master of the psychological. You're going to be working with a great many people, if you're not already, under great pressure. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is a template for either catastrophe or certain, certainly conflict. How can you resolve the conflict uh, amicably and have a successful outcome? Now, because it's a creative endeavor, uh, simple compromise or surrender is not really an option because if a producer comes to you and says, I'm sorry, uh, you can't do this shot and you know the shot is important for your film – you're going to still have to get that shot, but not alienate the director, so uh, sorry, the producer. So there is a psychological uh, component here where you're thinking, okay, what's the producer really saying? Um, they say they don't want the shot, but do they really care about the shot or are they concerned about the schedule and the budget? So you go back to them and say, I understand and I respect what you're saying. I, I hear what you're saying. You don't want to get the shot. Can I ask why? Mm -hmm. uh, you're trying not to threaten. Again, a psychological principle, people who are threatened display their worst behavior. That's why people very often behave badly on film sets because they're under pressure. It doesn't bring out the best in people always. It sometimes brings out the worst. You discover the producer is concerned about uh, the time and therefore the budget. So you say, okay, uh, let me do this. I can get that shot, but these other shots I was going to do in the afternoon, I don't need um, or I can eliminate. That'll mm -hmm. give me more time for this shot. We can achieve your budget and still get the shot, which I think is essential for the film. And let me explain why it's essential for the film. 
Yeah. Because there's another point. part, another part of psychology, which is I always say to my crew when I was a cinematographer as director, what my intention for the day is and why I'm trying to achieve the shots I'm achieving and what I hope to get. All those in all these complex and nuanced ways, everything that I'm thinking, my crew will know. Why? Because when people know why they're doing something, they're much more engaged and they feel part of the process. They feel recognized. They feel that you're sharing with them. They feel respected and they do better work. So in the example I'm giving with the producer, when you recognize that problem, when you explain to them why you want the shot and why it's important to you, they feel you respected them. They feel that you have a regard for their concerns and needs, and they will be able to work with you then and in the future. This is all part of the psychology, not only being direct, but I say of any uh, crew member. So right at the beginning of our talk, how so many directors feel more comfortable uh, dealing with the camera or with the technology than with people. Uh, just like we were talking about screenwriting, why we prefer outlines and structure to kind of freeform character development. Mm -hmm. It's because it's easier. It's less threatening. Um, it offers less resistance. But it's not the best way to go. The best way to go is to engage in the complexities, uh, to fully come to an understanding of them, and to create the best possible working environment, the best possible film. So the crew made up of people, people are complicated, but you have to deal with those complicated uh, people. And again, to review, if you lead by explanation, if you show your own vulnerability, if you create a nurturing uh, environment, um, if you do all those things, then invariably you'll have a successful film set and that usually leads to a successful film. And when you're a writer director, same basic principles, which is going to the humanity mm -hmm. of your writing, which means going to character. And I always begin in character, create lots of backstory, come to an understanding of who a character is. And then on the second and third draft, then I can work towards structure, but I don't, be given, I don't begin in structure and order. I embrace the chaos of the human condition. And that's from where my films, uh, film scripts will grow. And that's also how I work on film sets. Mm -hmm. You know, and one thing I want to mention, too, is that came to my mind recently was, you know, because when I write my shorts, you know, the characters, they're in some horrible mental states, you know, and, you know, it's a lot to ask an actor to, to, to go into those mental states as well. But, you know, I've communicated to them and I've said, I, I'm not asking you to do anything that I haven't put myself through, you know, like I've put myself through these you know, emotions just as much, you know, possibly deeper than what I'm going to ask you for. And um, Well, that's that's a great approach. And I, I would then go so far as to tell them what experiences you would have. I would say, if I when I'm talking to actors, um, when I work with actors, one thing I do is I have them uh, work on backstory a lot. So I will give every actor the backstory of their characters. And I'll write sometimes 70 or 80 pages of backstory that have nothing to do with the film narrative at all. Mm -hmm. Their childhood experiences, their first marriages, um, what their parents were like, uh, if they broke their arm as a kid, who their first boyfriend, girlfriend, or partner was, all that stuff. But I make sure it's nothing to do with the story. Then I ask the actor to build backstory on top of that based on their own experiences as who this character is. Then when I go to speak to an actor, I'll say, you know, that thing in the backstory where we talked about when you were a little kid and the car hit you and... Um, you were made fun of in school, whatever, and something for them to draw on. I'm not prescriptive as to how they should do the performance. I'm just giving them something that they can reference. Mm -hmm. And then the next step I'll do is I'll say, you know, this is not unlike an experience in my own life. When I was young, this happened to me, and I'll reveal something about myself. First of all, it builds a bridge between me and the actor. But secondly, they will then know that I have an understanding of what they themselves are dealing with. So I think that becoming a psychologist uh, in tandem or in partnership with an actor is a beautiful thing. You can start analyzing the character together. Why would the person be, be doing this? Why would they be feeling this? What makes them behave um, in this way? And if the actor doesn't have that understanding, asking them to do something they don't have a, a, an understanding of is very difficult. So the actor has to be a psychologist and you can help them uh, down that road of understanding.
And, you know, and I was thinking this could be an entirely different episode, trauma and the director, but it could kind of go hand in hand with the, the psychology episode. Um, well, how yeah, directors well, can use their own psych or use their own trauma. You know? Yeah, I think it's look, this is uh, one of the things that I uh, have come to understand about my own life is because it's been a long one now. And I kept thinking as I lived it, oh, this is a really bad experience. Oh, this is another bad experience. My God, this is a bad, this is the worst experience. This is another bad experience. And now as I look back on all those bad experiences, those are the things that allowed me to be a film director hmm. because I understand a lot of the way other people behave based on my own bad experiences. And by the way, some of my own bad behavior. The more you've lived, the more you understand. So if you want to be a director, you have to live the richest, fullest, most complex life you possibly can. It may seem disordered and mad and dangerous, but only later when you're speaking to an actor and you can draw on your own life experience with a genuine understanding, do you really appreciate how valuable those bad experiences were to you and to your actors and in your writing? Absolutely. So I'm a big fan of trauma. I, I admire people who direct at 21, 22, and 23, and some of them have had bad experiences. But then when they're speaking to a 40-year-old or 50-year-old or 35-year-old uh, uh, actor, or if they're speaking to someone who lives, has lived an entirely different life than they have, and they've got a limited amount of life experience, I, I think it's a great challenge for them to try to be empathic and understand how a person might behave if they've never walked in their shoes. I'm not saying the only directors are people who've lived complex, long lives, and every director has to be over 50. Uh, but I am suggesting the more life experiences you have, and be they real life experiences or vicarious life experiences through reading, through observation of art, through watching films, uh, the more experiences you have of different ideas, the more exposure you have to different types of experiences, the better the director you're going to be. Because a director, first and foremost, has to understand how humans behave. They have to understand how humans behave so they can lead a crew of humans, uh, a crew, a cast of humans, but also to understand the narrative itself and how humans behave. Mm -hmm. Well, as always, Stephen, wonderful advice that you give. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you again for coming on the podcast. My uh, my pleasure. I hope it was useful. And I didn't witter on too much. Uh, no, that's the point. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear you. Okay, great. All right. Well, let me know uh, how it all cuts together. And uh, let's, uh, let's keep doing this if we can, Matt. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, if you want to go ahead and plug your social media, I know we're going to be getting you a podcast going soon. Okay, great. Radical Secrets for Filmmakers, right? Right. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. At and then... Uh, your your Instagram is what again? My, my Instagram Stephen is, is Stephen Bernstein, um, uh, director writer, um, and I give little uh, tips um, in two different ways. There, I will sometimes do longer talks, a bit like this, um, and then sometimes just short little fifteen second insights into uh, how to do tricks in cinematography or directing or anything to do with the technology uh, and art of uh, of filmmaking. And then, as you rightly say, we're going to be having. Uh, these regular podcasts um, and look forward to doing that. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, Stephen. Well, thank you again so much. Thanks, Matt. And, um, Cheers. Awesome. Cheers. Bye-bye.